Hey, what's going on? It's Arava here, and welcome back to the Pit Lane Podcast, episode number 98 today, to discuss the news in Formula One and a lot of it's to do with. Should we change Formula 1, or we are going to change Formula 1 in 2021, how should we be changing it? A lot of different ideas floating about, a lot of, you know, opinions from different teams, and obviously then previewing the Russian Grand Prix, which I'm sure will be an absolute stunner, but uh, you're here back, you use your host, myself and Tom, once again, Callum could not make it, he's having some internet issues, so we'll plow on, that's just us two again. Um, So Tom, right, so after the unveil of the 2021 concepts, a few different parties like Haas and Renault have talked about a budget cap being the most important thing really apart from the rules and actually that should be prioritized is making sure there is a budget cap in place rather than trying to focus too much on the rule set because actually I'm kind of you know with them in a way I want to hear if you're with them as well in terms of like you can make all the rules in a way you want to create better racing but at the end of the day if teams like Ferrari, Merck and Red Bull are chucking in like twice three times as much as others it's you're still probably going to get them being a decent amount ahead um, even if the racing is kind of meant to be better with the rule set. So the budget cap for the likes of Renault and Haas, they're, they're bigging up the budget cap. I would agree with them. What about you? I'm not sure where I fall on this one because it's not small details. These are very big talking points. Yeah, you know, huge, they're huge. The pillars of F1. And I feel like when, you're make, when there's change in and around those big pillars of the sport, yeah. you should only dissect and direct your focus towards one of them entirely so you make sure you maximize it um but mixing in a budget cap with new regs while it yeah i can understand it makes sense at the same time i'm like focus on one or the other at the moment right. because you need to know it's like it's a very tricky one i don't know where i go on it's what i'm saying because i want to say if you, you should approve the sport's future by picking and creating a 2021 prototype that's going to be very good for the future for the racing of the sport However, if that means it's going to be expensive, then I'm not really sure where you fall. Because here's the thing. This is where you can you can make an argument out of it. F1 with the 2021 regs don't just want to make the racing better. They want to attract the big names. So do they sacrifice your, has, you know, your Force Indias, all these teams, to potentially bring in your Porsches, your Aston Martins, your Jaguars, there is that factor to it. So, like I said, I, I, I genuinely it's, do not know where I fall on this. It's but, an argument yeah. of bringing in teams, but also at the same time, like I, I don't know how far that would stretch necessarily because I, I think F1 a lot of the time, and also fans, I think we do this about, you know, oh, brands are surely going to buy in. And they just they just don't really like we have we like everything that we were talking about beforehand with Aston Martin or Porsche or anything for you know like the future has gone cold like the the period of them entering the sport for 2021 or 2022 I believe like the, the period they needed to enter all the the details nothing's come of it mm. so I don't know but then at the same time if you bring in rules for 2021 like playing a bit of, you know just a like a scenario here if you bring those rules in but you don't bring the budget cap, is it really going to make a big of an impact if you then bring in the budget cap for 2022? Because, like we've seen with the V6 era, if you get the head start and get the foundation strong, it is very hard to make up that time. It is very, very difficult. Mm. Um, so, like, if they if they don't have a budget cap for 2021, the new rules come in, inevitably the big teams have the funds to go big on R&D, and build up for that new regulation change. Whereas the smaller teams, the independents, or just the manufacturers that don't have as much money, can't. And then you bring the budget cap in for 2022. Yes, it'll help, but it'll help over the long term of like six years rather than a straightaway help of like two to three years that I feel like it would if they brought it in for 2021. Yeah, I I can see that. Um, I also think there was mention a few weeks ago of a potential inverted commas soft budget cap right being yeah. introduced even as early as next year i mean i would love ease that ease into love that. that so that way it's not such a a harsh a big, thing yeah and to be fair that would be a good way of doing it because you ease into it yeah fully and by 2021 it should be pretty sorted finalized stable by then it's kind of like a i mean Nah, no mind. I'm no, I've got I've got to do an analogy there, but there's actually no point in bothering. So, um, yeah, basically, just try and keep it nice and smooth. Transition towards that nice phase, 
and hopefully by 2021 have a set of regs that do go in hand with the softer budget cap. But, you know, if, if I'm being honest here, if you were to ask me, do I, do I want a budget cap or do I prefer performance and good racing? Now, first of all, I apologize for my dog absolutely going off in the background. Second of all, um, you have to... I, I would like to see good racing. I think I can stomach, at least for a short while, the potential of small teams getting scrapped. I know that's harsh and, you know, it hurts a bit. But let's think about the potential here of seeing cars actually race themselves, you know, properly. But I don't know. That's the thing, section. though. That, that's the, the argument here of, like, how much you, like, you can create a rule set. But if there's a big six, like, there's a two-second gap between the top and the midfield, yeah, you're going to get racing between those top teams. Yeah, you're going to get some racing between the midfield. But I think, I don't know. I feel like the the whole rule set of 2021 was not just to bring close racing between tiers of the grid it was to bring the entire grid closer as well true so i don't know like it's like a double-edged sword in a way of like you bring in these it rules is. and just like we saw for 2017 you know that that, that was the big golf maker because in 2016 it was it was there but it wasn't as big and 2017 came along and made the golf huge and it's mm. just grown in a, in a way almost for 2018 it's not really shrunk at all that golf um so I don't know. I feel like there's a double-edged sword of what you're really trying to achieve with good, quote unquote good racing of, okay, so the top three teams have really good races close together, midfield really close. But then there's this, you know, in the, in the like the uh, result standings, you have like a gap of the, yeah, like two tenths, three tenths, one second gaps. And then there's a big like fuck off kind of like 10 second, 15 second, th- like 50. Well, actually this year we've had like 58 second gaps. And then there's the yeah, midfield. Say, that's an improvement, mate. Not, yeah, not that a, would be improved. Yeah, thing. I'm doing F1 light there. I'm doing, that would be a great improvement. I'm doing F1 very light. Yeah, literally it's been like a whole lap gap. And then there's the midfield. I, I just hope that it, it closes up in that sense at the same time. Um, but I mean, I mean, with the budget cap, we've as a podcast. I think I think if you go all the way back to summer of last year, we were talking about the importance of shutting down the importance of having way more money than your competitors and getting it to a system where also the payout system is a lot like it is in the Premier League of football or just really most sports where it's actually a fair payout system. Um, yeah, I think I think there's different ways you can do a payout like a. A, a budget cap because it you don't essentially have to for example y- there's two routes you can take yeah. one you make a cost efficient f1 car so yep. no matter what the prize pool is for money every team wins or at worst draws even so you have a car that costs 20 million dollars to make but 20 million dollars is what the last team gets in the standings so that way you still keep the tiers in prize money so that it keeps the big teams and the little teams happy. Or not the little teams, but it keeps the, big, it keeps the manufacturers happy because they get their cut that they've always liked. But at the same time, it's feasible and you can run an F1 car at a neutral, if at worst, like a very small loss, not at its current rate, well, to be, which is no, to, well, to be fair, I think most te- I think most teams run at a loss anyway. I think they're like... They're, yeah, they do, is what I'm saying. Like the like, illusion... Uh, yeah, like at the moment, like every team is losing money. Even mm. Mercedes, they reported profits last year that they, it's because they've spun it in a special way. They're still losing money, even if they're saying they've yeah, made yeah, a profit. Yeah, I saw that. So, all, but what um, I'm saying is just like find a way to make the car a lot cheaper to make. Right, or, yeah. Or what you do is... You are, if you don't want to make the car cheaper to make, you keep the car at its current cost, but you budget the prize money. You put the you like the, like the Premier League. You make the prize money the same for everyone, and yeah. it's who can do the best well, with yeah. the money. And there's that. There's the affecting the prize money, but then there's the like the part B of also capping how much they're actually spending outside of their prize money yeah. on what you know on what they're on, on the r&d because like you got red bull merc ferrari chucking in how, however god knows how mm. much and renault as well probably um but renault probably not as much because renault come out and said they're in favor of the budget cap so i even though renault is a manufacturer you can you, you kind of you can always tell that renault don't have as much budget as everyone else uh, at the top there so there's yeah there's like two parts to it it's like the the prize pool as you say tom and then the actual spending like looking at it with a with, yeah the budget looking at it with a magnifying glass and going right hang on why are you spending this ridiculous amount compared to this small team um mm. yeah there's also been like interesting like going off a little bit of a tangent before we go on to other structured ideas of changing the sport there's been that 
crazy idea that Eccleston had. Like, I think it was back in 2012 or 2011 when the blowing diffusers were around. And I think it was like a Monza. He was talking to Sky about it of um, having this thing of if you spend under a certain amount over the year, you can do certain special stuff with the regulations. Like you're allowed to develop in a different way. And if you overspend, you're restricted in some areas of the car where you can develop. It's like interesting ideas like that, where it's kind of like, which way do you go about it? Are you going to spend a whole load, but be restricted more on what you can develop? Or are you going to spend under, but you're going to be more experimental with what you design? I, mean, I love the idea. I do. I like, I've like. i always liked that sort of thing. However, it's just not realistic. Yeah, like, realistically, it just wouldn't work. No, really. because <laughs> all the numbers and all the money around f going to come out and that could, in a way, give a really bad image of the sport in terms of its cost and people could really get put off by it and also say like, how this, how can this be so expensive, you know, and really sort of look at one in a bad way. But um, something like that would be awesome. I mean, it sounds almost like a thing you're doing in a racing game, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, sound, yeah, it sounds bonkers. It sounds crazy. Like, oh, okay, I'll spend like under f like 100 million in a year. So therefore I can do more experimental aero stuff and maybe get some good gains out of that. Or I'll spend 200 million and I'm restricted to only doing this certain kind of thing, but I can do that certain kind of thing really well with 200 mil. So uh, yeah, it's really uh, intriguing. But moving then on from that, so that's kind of been a talking point. Really the main, to be honest, the main talking point, the only kind of other talking point in F1 news this week kind of been still about total to Wolf and the Mercedes situation and whatnot, but we kind of already talked about that last podcast, um, a decent amount I think, so if you want to kind of know what we thought about that, check out last podcast there where we also talked about just after the Singapore Grand Prix um, but I think this the entire theme of this podcast was going to be you know, what are we changing in F1, apart from obviously previewing Russia. So I went to the Patreon, our Patreon Discord. By the way, if you do if you do like what we're doing around here, you can support us on Patreon. And if you support us uh, to a certain amount, you can get into our Patreon exclusive Discord. And so I asked the Discord server earlier what they would change in F1. One thing, one, one thing they would change in F1, and that was it. And then we would judge and kind of discuss that. So let's go through those different points before we get into then our kind of Russian Grand Prix preview. So... Uh, the first one by uh, Super Snake uh, was a third car for every team funded by the FIA with separate drivers and a separate constructors championship to give an opportunity for young drivers to prove themselves for a drive in the main two cars. Possibly a place for F2 champions to go, like as a qualification maybe. I think we, we discussed this pretty good in the last podcast because we, we touched on this third car topic. We touched on third cars, but okay, let's talk about the caveat of uh, we, we, we all, we've, we've also talked about funded by FI, but the, the thought of a separate championship, because then I think mm -hmm. that might go against and kind of solve maybe the issue that I think you and Callum were banging heads about of, a, you know, a third driver doing something stupid and taking a car out or something like that or affecting the championship in a direct way. If they had their own championship, then it's not actually like, obviously they could still take someone out. Exactly. But in that, terms of there points, is still that element. Mm -hmm. but in terms of the points they're scoring, it wouldn't help because also at that same time, I think it was Haas or I think Ren, either the two, those two have been banging on this week. But one of them said that a third car championship would really distort the constructors championship because it would really stretch out points then for the top teams and the midfield. And you just wouldn't get a good sense of actually how close teams are maybe because if a team, if one team rocks up and they get a one, two, three, that's a big deal in terms of distorting how mm. good another car is. Yeah, you'd have to like completely reshuffle the points as well because you'd have so many more cars in the grid. Yeah, so like, it would be a points change, so like top 15 score points. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot so, to it. So. so a separate championship, it definitely solves that kind of issue at the same time. A pot, I like the, I do, what I do like the most about that idea is a possible place for F2 champs to go. Like... I've always, I've always just, I, 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 I understand the rule of you can't race in F2 anymore if you're the champion, but with the way F1 is nowadays, it seems like such a harsh rule because it's like you, you are clearly fast enough then to maybe make the leap to F2, uh, F1, but you've got nowhere to go most of the time because there just aren't enough seats in F1 these days, and it's such a harsh rule of, okay, you're a champion, sit out now for a year or go do something else. Um, I think there's a lot of ways you can spin this. Like there, there could be a rule where F2 and F1 work together, where yeah. it's the other way around. The champion is guaranteed a seat in Formula One, 
wherever that may true, be. True, true. Because that would put pressure on the 20 F1 drivers to keep their job and extra pressure on the F2 drivers to win the championship. True, true. It could be like a FIA mandated kind of like they have to do it. They go out there and source the F2 driver a mandated deal. Exactly. And if I mean, it works... They, it's like football. If you yeah. win the, the second division, you're guaranteed to go up. You're not going to miss and not yeah. play a year. And it also plays into half and half kind of almost like, obviously the driver doesn't have financial fair like a uh, package, but it's almost like when you get into the Premier League, you get that financial boost of getting into the Premier League as well. So it's kind of, it's like hard, hand in hand, you're going to get a seat somewhere and you, mu- and you don't necessarily have to pay for it yourself. Like the FIA, if there needs to be any funding for your seat, the FIA will pay for it. Yep, definitely. But I think um, we can definitely tie that idea from Super Sky Snake um, into what we mentioned last week. There is a, maybe there is a world there somewhere where a third car with a separate drivers and constructors funded by the FIA for young drivers and F2 champions. Yeah, could I mean, it could, even, it, it, it could even be a separate race. It doesn't have to be the same race. It could be a different race, a bit of a shorter race, not a sprint race like F2, but like maybe you half. Say that, but maybe a sprint race because they want these sprint race formats and true F1 to change yeah the okay race that weekend. in a way okay so it could be like a 30 lap race maybe then or like a 25 lap race yeah where it's f2 champions only or third drivers of the teams only and they run the f1 car so it's it's essentially like you're watching another sprint f1 race but it won't piss off the you know traditionalists and just generally the fan base of f1 that it's gonna change the championship up because it's not for the championship it's just for a separate little third driver championship yeah i agree that would be a fun idea actually it would give also on the like you got you we know going to actual race weekend twice now of you know there are some periods when nothing's happening they could definitely squeeze in a third driver sprint race so, especially on Sundays when you have to get there so early. Especially on a Sunday, yeah. So yeah, that definitely could be like one of those like you know ideas that it's crazy, but it also makes kind of some sense in a way. Uh, mm. We now go to Ramek Fee uh, going for change all races to a two-hour uh, timer rather than a certain distance. So that mm. would, in some ways, increase the race time for most of the circuits. And then for like Singapore, it would well it, even Singapore didn't make the two-hour mark well, this a- year. A- every race would. Be long longer. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I don't really want to drive around Monaco for two hours. <laughs> True. You know what I mean. True. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't think. think. I think F one is already endurance enough for what it is for like a Grand Prix, like the definition of a Grand Prix. I think it's a perfect amount almost. However, we're gonna make it maybe an hour and a half timer, maybe ninety minute timer, ninety minute races, maybe. Um, two hours seems like we we do Singapore. I mean, I know it sounds poor, but you and I only just record on gameplay, but even when we do Singapore, it's such a long race. Like it's boring after a point. It's draining, especially when it's wet. I mean, even so, um, I mean, even as spectators of the actual sport, like sometimes you do have those races that drag on quite. Yeah, a like fair Spa bit. when we went this year felt long enough, and we was watching from a grandstand live. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure how. Fi- maybe if you do one and a half hours, ninety minute timers, maybe. Um, but for me, two hours is extreme. I mean, for me, at the moment, I, I've never had an issue with the race distance. To be honest, I think it's like no, 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 no. Yeah, I think I think they. If anything, kind of, Singapore needs to come down a bit. Yeah, almost. Yeah, I mean, most of the time, apart from maybe Singapore and like maybe one or two other tracks here and there, they they do quite a good job of trying to calculate. Okay, so the lap times this, we'll have this many laps for the Grand Prix. Then, um, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, I think both of us kind of agree on that. Kind of like yeah, maybe not two hours, one and a half, maybe, but even so, I don't think. I think the race distance is fine as it is. Uh, we go to uh, Ferrox then have uh, both the option of free view and pay TV in all countries. Pay TV still has no ads and like all the practice sessions, while free view just has quality and the race, but with ads. Um, I, I don't pay. I don't mind paying extra for, uh, for stuff and full coverage. It's not too bad in the UK, but here in Australia, only half of the races are live on free TV, and there's no live quality. Um, I still think it's bad in the UK to be honest, because the Channel Four only has now like ten races, and it's going to go to one race from next year. Yeah, so yeah. from next year for like the next, but at least there's highlights for every single race. Yeah, but to, I don't know. I don't know about other people. I I stop caring as much when the I, race I is actually not live like it's it seems weird even if i don't know the results i will care less because i'm not watching it live in a way uh i'm the same with football almost as well like if i watch match of the day of course i want to see all the banging goals and whatnot but i'll care this, less in the moment 
because I'm like I know the you know, it's just not the same in a way. I don't know. I it's hard for me to really think about this one or really give it much thought because it's so unrealistic nowadays with the way the sport is, unfortunately. Unfortunately, um, yeah. Unfortunately. I mean, football. It makes a good point when he says trap. in in that context because he says paid TV still has no ads. And like all the practice sessions, while free viewers just quality and race, but with adverts, it's basically the same concept of YouTube, YouTube Premium, um, slash ad blocker. Yeah, yeah. Um, I get that, but the way TV runs, slash, you know, I mean, it's not really TV anymore. It's just, you know, um, digital, whatever it may be. Um, with the way things work, you know, like commentators have a set time slot. You know, they have all these, all the, all the things that are like scripted down online to them. So like. At this point, you queue to transition into an advertisement. You know, you you end your point here, or they get a cue on the on the speaker or on the thing they're here saying, "Right, we need to go to an ad break." Uh, it wouldn't work showing the same. That like you need different coverage at the same time, if you know what I mean. You'd need commentators who commentate kind of, a non ad version. I float, I float this boat. I think it could work because Americans do this very well. You can do the commentary for the no ads one, and then what you do is you do American style. What they because I I noticed when I watch the Canadian Grand Prix now twice in a row in LA, I noticed what they do is they carry on commentating. Oh, I know what you mean. But I the commentary mean. goes a little bit quieter. It goes picture in picture. The the race goes to the top corner in a small box, and the rest of the picture is a big ad, and you can hear the ad slightly higher than the race commentary. So it does work, and I didn't get pissed off by. It. I wasn't very triggered by. It. I was, I was, just, I was kind of just bemused, like, oh, I forgot this is a thing because I keep every time I go there, I just forget it's a thing. But it's not that annoying because you're just like, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna end in like a minute. That's it, and then you're back. So yeah. I, it could work technically like that. Maybe. Um, it's an interesting concept. I, I, I definitely just agree with the idea of like it's, a, it's very annoying. Oh. For not it's just unrealistic. Australia, for but but for the entire world, it's just annoying. Spain's that. pay TV, Italy, England, Australia, Germany. Like it's it is annoying TV. because it does it, is. It, do, it does make the coverage suffer. Um, you can see that in the, in the viewing figures. But to be honest, there, yeah, I'm for like, you, me, like you said, the like, best thing that could happen is F1 TV is global. Because yeah. then everyone will yeah. be happy to pay. But unfortunately, that's a very much a magic pipe dream. Because as long of as course. these companies have all these contracts in place. It's just not going to happen. But, I mean, the thing is, it is just the way it is. It's not just F1. I mean, football's had the same thing. Football's had the same kind of issue where in the last couple of years, there's been a few little debates here and there about the declining viewership of, you know, Sky Sports and whatnot because these companies keep putting up the prices. Uh, and then you have, like, BT Sport jumping in and buying all the rights for the Champions League and whatnot, and you have to buy a different subscription for, for that kind of thing. So mm. it's kind of just almost the way it is, I think. I don't, I don't think F1 fans are in a unique position. They're pretty much the same position as most other sports spectators, apart from, like, maybe the, you know, I don't know, you're kind of like tennis or whatever. That's usually on free-to-air anyway. Um, so, yeah, it's an annoying thing. But, that I mean, that idea of the two different tiers could work in an American style. And then, like Tom said, the magical you know, peak of all this would be F1 TV is just global and you can, I would happily pay a certain amount for just F1 TV like that and I can get it on my phone, on the go, I can get it on my computer and whatnot. Um, but yeah, well, well, I think that's, uh, with Sky Contracts, it's uh, very much a pipe dream. Uh, next idea, Greg Schofield goes with Scrap Blue Flags. Only if, like I mentioned before, this would only work if the cars are raceable. The regulations yes, go the in favour. The ca the caveat would be, I think, if they're raceable. Um, because right now, yeah, I as would... cool as it would be to see the leader held up, it's not feasible. It's not logistical because you're going to get screwed over. The f person that's first gets screwed over the most by dirty air. Sure, they might be able to get past, but I think it's I think it's feasible. With, yeah, the cars were more raceable, and then also I feel like maybe you could do the rules in a way of like it's a, it's not a rule per se, but it's sort of like a gent like if the F1 drivers all have a gentleman's agreement of like. If you're not racing someone and you're being lapped, just, you know, you know there's no point holding the guy up behind you because you're getting lapped. But so if he just, wants to, he can. Yeah, so like That's a... That's like, non-blue flag comes in. Yeah, just like a nod, a nod of like, okay, gentleman's agreement, we'll let you buy if we're getting lapped. But if I'm racing someone for P15, I'm not letting you buy. I'm going to race him. Then I can let you buy, maybe. Yeah, because we have them races where a leader gets taken out and then he's at the back. He has your lap down. Like I remember Vettel infamously trying to unlap himself from Hamilton or the other way around. I'm not sure. Um, 
and you have those moments where they 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 race each other you know when Carter Khan well, yeah, I remember very battle. very good was uh 2012 when uh Hamilton got a puncture in Germany early on and he raced That's the one. And he yeah. raced Vettel and Alonso very hard um, when he was basically lapped. But he was like, deal with it. I'm fast enough not to get blue flags here because I can re-overtake you once right. you've overtaken me under blue flags. Um, so so it would work. be interesting. But yeah, like Tom said, straight away, it would have to be a caveat of raceable more cars. raceable cars. Because right now it's, it would be a nightmare. Like It'd be like the F1 game where everyone's going to lose five seconds trying to fight people, basically. Um, moving on to the next one. Um... I, well, actually, yeah. You know what, Jake? Uh, Jake in our Patreon thing has literally said the same thing. Tom, I was yeah. He's put oh, to yeah, great. Realize, yeah. Only if they fix the dirty air problem first. So right. yeah, there's the caveat of that. So um, yeah, for a lot of uh, straight with you, Jake. Uh, me and Tom on that. And then finally, uh, VR Parrick, uh, DRS for cars under two seconds in the last phase of the race. Now there was the uh, I think there was someone else in our Patreon the also. Up. Yeah. I think it was oh uh, yeah oh nine uh, Gittick, uh said define last phase. So yeah, it would be a, it would there would have to be a harsh kind of definition of last phase, mm. but at the same time also I'm just like as much as I would almost kind of agree like say oh they'd be really spicy, but also it, it, uh, even for me I think that that's a bit too gimmicky. Yeah, I mean like, I, I think I, it's I, enough that we have an extra DRS zone that pretty much yeah, every track like, now. And like if you follow the podcast for a while, you'll know how much I can sometimes lean into some of the more kind of artificial stuff if it's not too artificial, but that to me is even a bit too gimmicky, like just extend by under two seconds. Cause then you might just have some ridiculous like scenarios of like, you've done so well all race to get into a position and you've just kept it at an honest one second gap or just 1.2, 1.8 and then bang like that. And the last phase two second rule comes in and they get DRS like what the hell has just happened here? Yeah. Especially when we've got three, like three DRS, prolonged three DRS zones over a circuit. Yeah, like, some circuits, yeah. Oh, um, well, getting out of a second is going to be hard. And then again, dirty air. That's what I'm saying. It, it's hard to imagine these things in a way because you just don't know. Like, logically speaking, dirty air is going to get worse and worse until 2021. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And you're, you're, it's, I, I find it very intriguing that every single point almost has a caveat of, well, what's the dirty air like? So, I, I have a point which will not have a caveat Go on, go on. One of my own. So first, right. first of all, thank you to everyone in Discord who chipped yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, appreciate that. that was good, um, good shout responses. out to you guys. And I've said it for ages. You probably see you, you see me on Twitter. You might know what I'm on about. Um, it's, it's a simple detail, but change the podium order around. Start off by giving the trophy to the third place, then second, and then first. The same way MotoGP do it. It makes sense. You build to the climax of the main man winning the race so you'll get the cheers go up you know so third place hey second place hey it's the british grand prix hamilton's won he's first he gets a trophy last hey it's not hey oh uh, in that order going down hamilton gets the biggest cheer he wins the british grand prix then i can't down, lie it's down. a good idea but it's also not the most important idea <laughs> no but it's something that I'm shocked has not been tampered with considering yeah. okay, the change It's not a groundbreaking year. rule change. It's the thing that they could fix no, easily next race. <laughs> but they should. Basically. Like, yeah. they should also that bring back weird. the interviews yeah, on weird. the podium, in my opinion. I like them on the podium because I think with all the fans there, I don't know, I think it's, just, I think it's better. I, pre- I prefer it as well. Um, it's just adding to the, to the experience and to the sport, I think. There's a lot of other things you could do potentially pre-race stuff as well. Um, like, like I said, you can tr- always try and improve the spectacle outside of the one and a half hours they go racing on the racetrack. Yeah, I mean, personally. I mean, I think all th- all three of us have said it many, many times on the on the podcast about cre- you know making the entire weekend a fun weekend. So even if the race is a little bit you know mediocre, you still enjoy the weekend um, despite you know what it was like. So mm. yeah, there's always st- there's always stuff they can add to it. But, and I um, think they could do a l- a lot better because they like showing off their fancy replay cam graphics we miss so many midfield lower half overtakes just because they're focused on a battle for true, p6 true. yeah between the red bulls and they just follow them lap after lap gap 1.5 1.2 1.5 1.1 1.4 nothing happens in the meantime ericsson's overtaken stroll all right it's a move on the back straight but it's still a bloody overtake which is something yeah. we don't see. So they could do a lot more by showing replays of overtakes, in my opinion, instead of sh- 
going back to the lap one all the time. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know that famous graphic of the lap 42 yeah, the lap, incident? Yeah. yeah, it's just like, oh, why have you cut to that? We've seen or that. even recently, going back to a 2012 we've turn seen, one incident. We've seen that like 500 times now, mate. Give it a break, lad. Um, yeah. yeah. But I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a, yeah, a lot, a lot of really like decent kind of like interesting ideas that make you think really about what the sport could be in the future. And it, it, that's kind of almost the great thing about F1 and like other sports is it's very malleable as a sport. Like it can change its its shape and still be F1 at the end of the day. Mm. Um, so some I, some interesting debates really. I want to put a question out there for the viewers. Out of the three concepts that we saw, which one? Do you prefer? I'm personally going to say three. At first, I wanted one. The more I look at it, I like three more. I'm going to say number two. I kind of like the the Ooh, in between one, like one the least between mm. one and two. Like it was like it, it had some complexities of three, but also is simple like one in some ways. So kind of like middle ground almost. Right. So uh, yeah, so already let's already know. a disagreement between two people. So I'd let, love to see what the comments have to let's say. Know the, let's know. Let's not. To be honest, the most the thing I loved about two and the reason why I maybe don't like it as much as three was just the the break the rear the past the front tire deflector idea they had. It looked a lot better on two. Like on three, it just looked crazy. But yeah, there are a lot. Of, there are a lot of parts of three that I do like that. You know that just rocket ship kind of look. But at the same time, I kind of looked at two. I because at first I was with you. I think I was three, and then I kind of looked at two a few more times. Like, you know what though? I kind of do appreciate that sleekness of lack of some things here and there, which is odd for me to say, because as you know, as a kind of nerdy yeah, guy like that, say, I, was, I, I would that. love that. Yeah. So it's kind of going against my own for thing. Me, but I kind of also I think three is a better looking version of Formula E's Gen Two car for me because, for example, I like uh, the new Formula E car, but two things I hate about it. Are the very, very, I know very, you very yeah, you said it before. wide nose, yeah. and the from the back it looks like it's a masterpiece from the back, but from the front and slash like side angle, the fact it's got it hasn't really got a proper rear wing, it looks off to me. It looks off. Whereas Concept Three has a very tasty looking rear wing and rear end section with a massive diffuser. So for me, it's like uh, it ticks the boxes, which for me just didn't quite sit well with me with the Formula E car. Yeah, yeah. So um, it'd be, I think it'd be nice. And I think it'd also be a lot more correlation between the two series with the cars being much more similar looking, which I think Maybe. Might, might be an interesting thing. Maybe. I mean, for Formula E, sake, I don't think it's going to help F1 in any way. Um, but we'll move on then to the preview of the Russian Grand Prix mm. and our predictions then. Russia will be an interesting one, Tom. Um, last year was a very odd one. Hamilton was off that entire race weekend. Bottas was, was the main man. And even to the point where, if, like, I only just saw a replay of it on Twitter earlier of Kimmy, a replay of Kimmy being confused at why he came in after <laughs> Bottas. And it was because Kimmy didn't even know Bottas was the one leading the race at that point. So, uh, yeah. And apart from that, I think the only thing I remember from Russia was Alonso retiring. And that was it, because it literally was one of the most boring races of 2017. So it I'm was. praying to God it is not that bad. I think Be there's other things to point out. Yeah. Ferrari locked out the front row in qualifying that, that, that time. Yeah. And that was the first front row lockout, I think, in like... Ages. Years. We're talking, like, I think that was the... I, I, can't tell if they, I can't remember if they locked out the front row in the first few races before that, whether it be China, Bahrain, Australia. But I think that was the first front row lockout they had in like ages. So you'd have to think, again, it should suit their car. However, lately, they've got some tire wear trouble on their car. And they keep on going really aggressive with the tire compounds. And that yeah. seems to be really biting them in the ass. So, um, yeah, I'm not really sure where I go or where I fall on this. I just hope it's an all right race. Six out of ten for Russia. Hopefully, oh, minimum that. Bad. But let's go into predictions then, Tom. It's only me and you, so very easy to do back and forth. So, pole position, who are you going for? <sighs> don't Blank go with my heart, don't go with my head. Um,. I don't. I actually, yeah, I don't know most of the time which I go with most weeks. You know <laughs> what? I'm. I want to go with my head. All right. Drum roll. <laughs> I'm gonna I, say it's gonna be a shocking, isn't it? I think Hamilton's taking the whole weekend. All right. So you're going pole. I'm gonna go with on pole. I will go Valtteri Bottas. Surprise. What? After we bashed him in the last podcast, what? Yeah, go on. And then the race. Um, I told oh, you, Hammer's taking five. the whole weekend. Well, top five. Yeah, give us the top five, though. Um, Lewis, Vettel, 
Verstappen, Kimi, Valtteri. Right, I'm going to go with Hamilton wins it, even though Bottas gets the pole. Going to go with... Gonna go with. Ooh, I will go. Mm, I will go with Vettel second, even though I think it's such a kind of like. Oh yeah, we'll get second again, like sort of like behind Hamilton. I, I want to say he's gonna do worse, but I can't actually see. I can't see Raikkonen being ahead of him at Russia, and I can't see Bottas actually doing that well around Russia, even though he did well last year. And I can't see the Red Bulls going well at all around there. So, I'm gonna go Hamilton, Vettel. I'll go Bottas, Raikkonen. And I will say Ocon. Ooh. Just out there. I'm going to say the Red Bulls Ooh. have a tussle maybe with some of the cars. Not just, a Haas back again. Best of the rest. No, I'm going to go with Ocon. Just comes out of nowhere. He's, you know, he needs to do well. He's angered after last race. Comes out <laughs> of nowhere. P5. Boom. Um, yeah, that's my predictions then for the Russian Grand Prix. Let us know what you guys think in the cons below but i think that's going to be the end then of a uh, very interesting podcast i, I like that discussion that was a nice uh, foray of ideas um for f1 in the future mm. so guys if you did enjoy it yourselves then be sure to hit that like button you can check us out on screen our twitters are always there as as always a reminder we are on audio on soundcloud and itunes links below and like we mentioned i mean a lot of this podcast was in aid from our patreon so if you do like what we're doing around here you want to get involved in future episodes where we do lean on the patreon questions way more than other times then yeah if you do like what we're doing around here then you can check the link out below and uh, maybe get support and you can be in our discord server and discuss whatever you want as well along along with that on race weekends i know uh, that those of uh, them in in our patreon server do discuss the races uh, amongst themselves as the race goes on um so you can get involved in that and uh, finally if you do fancy getting yourself a uh, chair for your for your desk or a racing chair for f1 2018 or any other racing activities you can check out g2 omega and use the code pit lane f1 that will also help us directly as well if you do look like what we're doing around here but that's been podcast number 98 and we'll see you guys next time to review the russian grand prix it's been me and tom till next time hope you enjoy the rest of your day guys goodbye